Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, COVID-19 kicks kids out of school. My class numbers have been practically decimated. Dozens of students isolating, some schools with outbreaks, and the year is just getting started. Canada's top soldier admits the army has a serious issue in its ranks. Yes, we have a problem with, uh, with far-right activity um, across the army. And it's struggling to stamp it out. Why a reservist who expressed extreme views is still in the forces. A fast do-it-yourself COVID test. It was like super easy. You just have to spit into a tube. The technology exists, so when will Canadians be able to use it? A pretty rude awakening. The tide had come in and I began to panic. He fell asleep in a tent and woke up in the Bay of Fundy. If you've ever been on a waterbed, that's exactly what it felt like. You'll want to take a moment for this moment. This is The National. Schools have barely reopened across Canada and already COVID-19 is disrupting the year. Yeah, students and employees testing positive, in some cases forcing entire classes to isolate at home. Already, Quebec says at least 70 schools across the province have been affected, another 50 being monitored. In Ontario, at least five schools in the Ottawa area dealing with COVID exposures. Manitoba revealed its first school-related case today, a high school student in Winnipeg. And Alberta is now facing three school outbreaks, two in Calgary, one in Lethbridge. Now, Alberta has the highest per capita COVID rate in the country, recording another 113 infections today. The big fear is the virus getting entrenched in the school system and spreading like wildfire. Here's Carolyn Dunn with what we know tonight. After just two days back at school, Maddie Fleming is now confined to her home, porch and yard for two weeks. It was a little bit disheartening, to be honest, because I was super ready to go back anyways. She's worried about falling behind in grade 12 classes and about her health. I have to work even harder to teach myself things that would be hard for me to learn from a teacher anyways. And then am I willing to go back and risk getting sick or risk having to stay in for another two weeks? More than 20 schools in the province have at least one COVID case, and Maddie's high school is one of three with a declared outbreak. That's two or more infectious people. Well, I am quite stressed about it, but I'm also very confident that the school is doing everything it can um, under the government re regulations. Crowded hallways like this seem to be a reality inside some of the larger schools, and the bigger fear is those who flout mask rules. People sometimes bring their masks down underneath their noses or even on their neck, uh, which is a big concern for me because I'm so afraid that I'll catch it, be asymptomatic and pass it on to my family as well. Health authorities are asking parents to remind their kids about safety protocols. And so schools can do a certain amount uh, and then really the rest of us need to pick up that responsibility outside of the school environment and carry it forward. But with positive cases and now outbreaks coming at a quicker pace than most expected, many parents feel like they've been left with more questions than answers. We're trying to, you know, send these kiddos into the world and give them the best chance in a very uncertain time. And the more information we can have, the better choices we can make. Tough when it's impossible to guess what the next school day will bring. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. And B.C. is now in uncharted territory, recording its highest number of daily COVID cases since the pandemic began. 139 infections today, on the first day of school, no less. Susanna De Silva looks at how families and teachers fared on day one. So this is a little bit big here. Yeah. Seven-year-old Raphael is starting grade two, and his mom worries that the rules in the classroom are different than what he's learned at home. And even now when we go shopping and groceries, I'm like, don't touch, keep two meters away, keep two meters. And now I, I'm basically saying, well, if the teacher says so, then you can go. But in schools, physical distancing within cohorts isn't required, and masks are only mandatory for middle and high schoolers in common areas. In Rafael school district, close to 90% of students have opted to be in the classroom, while Surrey, the province's largest, is still trying to figure out how many kids will return. 
think unfortunately, you know, the standards that we really need, like smaller class sizes to the tune of, of even 15 or, you know, 22, uh, we're not seeing that. Teacher um, Annie Ohana will have at least 28 kids in her class, and that's not her only concern. And if something goes wrong, then we're going to feel responsible for that. But even as BC reports its highest ever daily caseload, Dr. Bonnie Henry still feels confident schools can reopen safely. We know that we'll have um, cases that, that pop up, and we've seen that in other provinces where school has started as well. If there's no transmission event in the school or there's no exposure when somebody is infectious in the school, then that is not considered an outbreak. And for some families, there was relief today. It was very, very great, and I colored. I thought it, would, it was going to be a lot more chaotic, given how um, unsure and uncertain we were uh, this past few weeks. But it's been a, a lot more organized than I expected. But she knows her comfort level with the back-to-school plan could change again. Goodbye. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. So those are the COVID hotspots in the West. In central Canada, Ontario saw 170 new cases. That makes 15 days in a row now with more than 100 daily cases. Quebec is also reporting more cases, 188 today, also part of an upward trend. And now the government is cracking down. Starting Saturday, people who break rules around masks can be fined by police. Alison Northcott shows us a province getting tough. <laughs> When it comes to rules like wearing masks where required, Quebec says most people are complying. But those who aren't, says the Premier, can cause problems for everyone. There's a small minority for all kind of reason that uh, are against. Some of these people, they even think that uh, Elvis is uh, alive. But it's time that uh, we give fines to the few ones who put at risk our society. So, starting this weekend, those who refuse to wear masks when they're supposed to can get a fine from police. Radio Canada has learned they could range from $400 to $6,000. Having a higher authority stepping in and taking over, I think it alleviates, you know, a lot of, like, hostile interaction between, you know, um, client and employees. It comes amid an upward trend in new cases, with some regions under close watch. It's unfortunate that the government thinks that um, they need to find people and threaten people with penalties in order for them to comply with something that just makes sense and that is good for their health. How long do you expect you have to wait here today? <laughs> Two to three hours, I'm hoping not more. Some testing sites like this one in Laval, north of Montreal, are trying to keep up with a spike in demand. So it's going to be really, really long, but if not, my, my son cannot go to school. It's just better if they wait like an hour for that than just go inside of a crowd and just infect everybody. While the new measures target public spaces like stores, health officials say private gatherings have become a big concern. In Quebec's lower St. Lawrence region, officials say college student parties are the source of 20 cases, part of an alarming surge there. An association of bar owners says it's been warned karaoke will be banned across the province after dozens of cases were linked to a karaoke night in Quebec City, a sign of more crackdowns to come. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Meanwhile, Ontario's premier says too many people are breaking the rule by ignoring quarantine orders and Ottawa's plan to enforce them is failing. Guys, the system's broken. You know, we can't have our police running around and seeing p people breaking quarantine and nothing happens to them, a slap on the wrist. It, it turns into be a joke. So I'm going to work with the federal government and we'll get that uh, turned around. Now, the Federal Quarantine Act requires most people arriving in Canada to isolate for 14 days, even if they don't have symptoms. Doug Ford says since March, there have been more than 600 violations in the province, but most people were not penalized. The federal health minister says the rules are clear and so are enforcement measures. Well, just weeks after Bill Morneau stepped down as finance minister and as an MP, he has been found in violation of the Elections Act. Last year, in the lead-up to the election, Morneau attended two official events as finance minister and publicly touted prospective liberal candidates. That broke the rules, says the elections commissioner. Morneau's former riding association has paid back about $1,600 in costs for those events. Morneau was fined $300 and must post these findings on social media.
And now a startling admission from Canada's top soldier. He says far-right activity is a problem across the army. Our Marie Brewster had reported on reservists with links to extremist groups. Now he has this exclusive interview. Stand by. Canadian Rangers on the rifle range. Part-time soldiers with lives and opinions that are not always subject to military discipline. We have a problem with, uh, with far-right activity um, across the Army. If we have one case, that is one case too many. A CBC News investigation recently revealed Canadian Rangers with links to two far-right groups, including one reservist, Eric Meigland, who called the Prime Minister a treasonous bastard online. And we've got to do everything we can to, uh, to stop this toxicity from seeping into our ranks. So stop it by screening it out before individuals uh, who hold these types of belief com beliefs come in and crush it when we find it. But the Army is struggling to do just that. Miglin was ordered released from the Army over a year ago, but he's still serving and likely won't be removed until later this fall. The reason why is now the subject of an Army investigation. He has not been disciplined. A reservist on part-time service is not subject to the Code of Service Discipline uh, while not on duty. Not everyone buys that. Do they have the mechanism? And I suggest that yes, they do. The National Defense Act, specifically Section 129, allows the Army to prosecute offenses that prejudice good order and discipline, but it would need to build a case in order to prosecute. Activists say the Army has to do a better job of monitoring soldiers on and off the job. Commanding officers need to occasionally be looking at the social media profiles uh, of the individuals you know, that, uh, that are under their command. Uh, and recognize the signs, you know, when they're talking about hateful ideologies to, uh, to flag things for, for investigation. CBC News has repeatedly asked Eric Miglin for comment. He's not responded. The investigation into Miglin and his Ranger unit is expected to wrap up this fall. Murray Brewster, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, at least eight people have died in the wildfires raging across the western U.S. They are moving fast, fanned by high winds, catching entire communities unprepared. In Washington state alone, more land has burned in one day than usually burns in a year. More than 200 fires are burning across three states, spreading, even merging. And as Rafi Bucci Canyon shows us, some people are fleeing their homes with moments to spare, while others have gotten trapped. <laughs> From Washington State to California, nobody's quite seen anything like this before. It's so dark up there, so smoky up there, so windy up there. Jay Tao fled his home. He doesn't know if it'll still be there when he returns. It's sad because you don't know what's up there, you know, that you're losing up there. Get that. Water, turn the water on! Water, 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 water. In Washington, neighbors work together trying to save property. In this Oregon neighborhood, some have lost that hope. Right now, we're just on the road. Uh, we've been sleeping in our cars and parking lots. And there are those who lost war. In Washington, a one-year-old boy was killed. His parents severely burned as they tried to flee the Cold Springs fire this week. A 12-year-old and his grandmother were unable to escape the flames in Oregon. My heart goes out to all of the families impacted uh, by this devastating event. The flames moving so fast, firefighters are issuing warnings with minutes to spare. I would say probably most of them were running for their lives. Um, you know, some of the folks we encountered last night, this thing hit really fast. They, they were sleeping. You know, we woke people up. So. Part of the problem is communities weren't prepared. It's very early in the season for these types of winds and the amount of smoke and the fire growth is unprecedented. Flanagan also co-hosts a CBC podcast on wildfires. He warns these fires could get worse. We're seeing climate change in action. Something Canadians need to mind as well. Though these flames are burning across the border, the smoke has made its way to southern BC, prompting air quality warnings. Rafi Bujikani and CBC News, Edmonton. Investigators are looking into a huge fire in Beirut, a city still reeling after a massive explosion killed nearly 200 people. 
fire erupted at a warehouse storing aid for those affected by the explosion. No injuries were reported, but officials say relief efforts will be seriously disrupted. Lebanon's president says the fire could have been the result of sabotage, a technical error, or negligence. Well, the World Health Organization is urging people not to get discouraged after suspension of late-stage trials of a potential COVID-19 vaccine. I think this is a good, uh, perhaps a wake-up call or a lesson for everyone um, to recognize the fact that there are ups and downs in research. AstraZeneca put trials of its experimental vaccine on hold after a participant suffered neurological side effects. It is considered one of the front runners in the race for a vaccine. And then there's Russia's vaccine, Sputnik V. The agency behind it says a deal has been made to produce the vaccine in Brazil and a mass inoculation campaign is now underway before trials are even complete. Chris Brown has that story from Moscow. Russia is hyping that its new coronavirus vaccine will save the world. Named after Sputnik, the first satellite in space, the pitch is that by stepping up to test it, volunteers are joining something historic. Dmitry Bekbaev was convinced he's one of the first. It may be scary to be the first, but it's an honor, he told us. As a theater director, he says he deals with large groups, so it's better to try it than not. We're proud to be at the forefront, the clinic director told us. These tests involve 40,000 volunteers and are part of phase three of the vaccine trials. Normally, you'd see if the trial is effective before launching a mass inoculation campaign, but Russia is not waiting. Government workers, including teachers, will be offered the vaccine within weeks and everybody else not long after that. The Kremlin's point man on the vaccine says any doubts about whether Russia is cutting corners should have been erased when the respected medical journal The Lancet concluded that early results on 76 subjects had a good safety profile and produced strong immune responses. The Lancet study confirms we're doing everything right and that Russia is a leader, said Kirill Dmitriev. Prominent Russians, including the defense minister, have already taken it, and other countries, such as the Philippines and Saudi Arabia, have reportedly ordered one billion doses. And yet, concerns persist. Nineteen scientists from the U.S., Italy, and other countries have signed a letter suggesting something about the Russian data still looks funny. There are figures in the paper that are very similar to each other, and it, it is like uh, you have repeat the data twice. The vaccine maker has sent a response, but it's not been made public. Surveys suggest many government workers may still need some convincing and fear being pressured into taking a vaccine that's still being tested. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. And vaccines were just one topic BC's provincial health officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry, was asked about in an interview that you will soon see here on The National. What's your best guess as to when there'll be a vaccine available? Oh, the optimist in me is like early 2020 or 2021. I, I, you know, I, I see a couple of good things, a little bit of a setback with one of the vaccines uh, recently. But Are you getting updates? Oh, yes, yeah. absolutely. We follow, there's about 50 some that we've been following, but uh, I, I'm hopeful in the new year and by next summer, we'll be in a good place. You can see Ian's full interview with Dr. Henry tomorrow night here on The National. Okay. NFL football is back tonight. Next on The National, will the league join others in protesting racial injustice? Also, how close is Canada to a simple at-home test for COVID-19? It could be a game changer here. And he fell asleep in a tent and woke up in the Bay of Fundy. So I climb out of my tent, all naked and stuff. And it's literally half sinking, but half floating at the same time. And that is just the start of his story. We're back in two. The NFL is back. Against the backdrop of a pandemic and a reckoning over race, the Football League kicked off its season tonight. Thomas Degler looks at its unprecedented efforts to address racial injustice and whether it's enough. As only a single player took a knee during the U.S. National Anthem, even at the start of a new season amid a racial reckoning, 
There was no mistaking who inspired this. Colin Kaepernick, who four years ago was chastised for the same form of protest, a gesture meant to highlight racial inequality and police violence toward black Americans. I think our league uh, is finally able to admit that how they handled the situation in 2016 and 2017 was wrong. Kaepernick was sidelined, though that was before this. Black Lives Matter! Months black. of demonstrations highlighting Black Lives Matter and echoing Kaepernick's message even louder. We should have listened to our players earlier and been able to understand the things that were going on in our communities. I think they're doing the right thing because they have to, not necessarily they want to. The NBA provided a template this season by amplifying players' voices and allowing them to take a knee entire teams at a time. The NFL family will honor victims of social injustice by wearing those victims' names on their hats and on their helmets. The NFL also spelling it out right on the field. I really don't think putting the phrase end racism in an end zone is going to actually end racism. Personally, I'm more interested in, in substantive changes as opposed to performative acts. The NFL's ban on kneeling during the anthem is still on the books. And while most players are black, nearly all club owners are white. People of color are left with less power and a smaller share of the wealth. How much business is this multi-billion dollar NFL enterprise doing with black businesses? You know, I mean, that's the bottom line here about Black Lives Matter, the economy. There's so much at stake, and it goes well beyond a game. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, and coming up next, how close are we to a simple at-home COVID-19 test? It was like super easy. You just have to spit into a tube. We look at the future of testing and why experts say we can and need to do better. And later, no red carpets, no crowds of screaming fans. The curtain lifts on the Toronto International Film Festival during a pandemic. We didn't see 2020 coming. The coronavirus and COVID-19 have dramatically changed our world, the way we work, the way we learn, even the way we play. Navigating these present realities, death, distancing, the divisions apparent in who is bearing the brunt of COVID, all of it can show us powerful lessons for the future. New directions for schools, offices, and public health. So this week, the National is looking at the future and where we could go from here. Tonight, the future of testing. The threat of COVID may loom for years. So how do we detect it faster, better, and more often? It's no small feat what's already been achieved. Testing efforts that might normally take years have leapfrogged in just months. Still, that testing has shown there's a need and desire for something better, and it may be closer than we think. In Canada, this is progress. I'm going in deep and it does burn. Just Hospital just... caliber testing virtually anywhere you need it. Just roll down your car window. Yeah, I definitely feel that. <laughs> this is my first time getting tested. It made it extremely not intimidating. Like, I feel like I could come back if I needed to, for sure. I like it because everyone's really prepared and I, and I don't even have to get out of my car. <laughs> And sure enough, when the Grand River Hospital in Kitchener, Ontario made the switch from walk-in to drive-through. We would see between 175 and 200 patients a day in the hospital. And then we moved to the drive-through testing center and we're able to process at least 400 cars a day on average now. More than double. More than double, yeah. Lots of symptomatic people today. Uh, yeah, lots and lots. But Dr. Jay Green and his team, despite having done more than 30,000 tests on this site to date. Okay, I'm Dr. Green. No, uh, this is still just symptoms? the tip of the innovation okay. iceberg. No fever. Because no this model has one fundamental flaw. I'll give that a B to a C, <laughs> right? A drive through, you still got to wait. You're going to have to wait for results. Our ability to understand how disease is spreading in the community is totally limited by patients coming forward to assessment centers and getting tested. We need to do better than that. Dr. Andrew Morris is an infectious diseases specialist at Toronto's Mount Sinai Hospital, and he also teaches at the University of Toronto's medical school. I think the gold standard where we really need to be is that people can get tested when they want to be tested, and uh, more importantly, 
where they can be tested that's convenient for them. So here's what's possible when you allow people like these university students to take testing into their own hands. It was like super easy. You just have to spit into a tube five milliliters and it wasn't that bad. It was definitely a bit easier and a lot quicker. Saliva-based testing like this is widely seen as the future. The samples analyzed at the University of South Carolina's own lab, with results coming in 24 hours. Data this fast is powerful, and the technology is already here. You just can't use it yet. This is one saliva-based test submitted to Health Canada for review. It's from a company called Diacarta. It can be done anywhere by anyone because it doesn't require a nurse or a doctor to administer. And it's pretty simple. You spit into the tube. Once you've collected enough saliva, you would mix the results with a preserved liquid that they send to you as well. You cap it off, you seal it up, and then you mail that to a lab and you wait for your results. The FDA in the United States has already approved this for emergency use, but here in Canada, it's still under review. I think it's really important that Health Canada does take their time. But on the other hand, I do think that they need a phase shift in, in terms of how they're thinking about diagnostic testing. Health Canada has taken a much more cautious approach to testing than the United States. One concern, accuracy, but also user error. The idea that people can't really be trusted to do the job of a health professional. What do you think about that? Well, I do believe that people can't be trusted to do the job of a health professional, but we can't keep on thinking that all of these tests are the job of health professionals. If we rely on people to make decisions based on whether they have a sore throat or a fever, at least we should be able to ask them to make decisions on whether a test is positive or negative and how to act on that appropriately. And in labs across the country, researchers racing to design better and better tests. This part of the device will go in the mouth. At the University of Saskatchewan, they're developing a saliva test that can deliver near instant results, and you can use it at home. If the patient has COVID-19, this device is going to change their color to red. At the moment, we are working the size and the shape of a, a pregnancy test. Dr. Walter Sequeira is leading the development of this test. If we have a test that the person can do in half an hour to one hour, and if it's negative, the person can come to the college, the person can come to work. And so this is something that is, I can see that could be a game changer here. But these things take time. His best guess when the device might be in operation, 2021. Back at the drive-thru, easy to see how a spit test would be a game changer. If it was something like live a test, do you think that would change how often you get tested? Yeah, if I felt it was just spitting in a tube, something as simple as that and painless, I would probably be more up for it. If the saliva tests work, uh, then we should do more of it then. I feel like a lot of people are terrified of the idea of the nose like the invasion of the nose, uh, spitting in the tube would definitely be a lot easier. We need to be able with more confidence to open up our society. And we're not gonna be able to open up our society until we either have herd immunity through vaccination or we're able to dramatically reduce the risk of infections entering into congregate settings and that's gonna be through diagnostic testing. Right, because the price of not being more ambitious with testing is what? I think it's going to be prolonged lockdowns, prolonged social isolation, and really, you know, the life that we're leading right now, it's going to be very, very difficult for us to ease up any further restrictions unless we, you know, improve on how we do our surveillance. So, uh, you know, there are some really exciting uh, developments when it comes to diagnostic testing. But also, you know, even beyond that, you can think of all the different communities across the country that are, are really making strides in getting a handle on surveillance testing. So, for example, testing sewage or wastewater to be able to understand the prevalence of COVID-19 infection on a community scale. It's, it's really fascinating stuff. Well, in the story of COVID-19, it's very hard to find good news. Any measures of good news? I think you might have done that. <laughs> mm. Ahead tonight, imagine going to sleep in your tent and then just waking up in the Bay of Fundy.
I was on the ocean. Am I literally floating out in the Atlantic Ocean? Oh yeah, and he was naked. You gotta hear how this one ends. But first, look who's back. Rosie's here with that issue. Adrian, after a really busy summer, the panel is back to look ahead to what could be an even busier fall between the throne speech, the pandemic, and an ongoing ethics investigation. Chantal, Andrew, and Althea will set the stakes for the weeks and months ahead. That's next on The National. Parliament may be prorogued for another two weeks, but it's already shaping up to be a busy political season from managing a global pandemic. We are all still living in an emergency. To a new conservative leader. We will show all Canadians that we are a government in waiting. This minority government will soon be put to the test with a speech from the throne and a confidence vote, all while the prime minister still faces his own ethics investigation. So how is the government and the opposition positioning itself? It's Thursday, and at issue is officially back, although you could say we never really left. Chantal Hebert, <laughs> Andrew Coyne, and Althea Raj. It was a particularly uh, busy summer. But but let's turn our attention to what we are expecting this fall. Uh, I want to do one go-round, if I can, on the latest uh, WE controversy, the charity announcing it's going to shut down its operations in Canada. And just in terms of where that leaves this whole issue, uh, does it change anything in terms of the politics of it? Um, Andrew, I'll start with you. Uh, very little, I would think. Um, it certainly shows what uh, dire shape the charity was in uh, prior to this whole mess uh, erupting. Uh, and that, of course, is part of the key claims and arguments made by the opposition on this, that basically the, the, uh, the we people came to the government with whom they had very tight connections uh, and looked for a bailout, looked for a, a, a lifeline. Uh, so that that question still remains, and all of the questions remain about uh, who knew what and and mm -hmm. the degree to which the prime minister recused himself or didn't recuse himself. These questions have not gone away at all. Chantal, do you do you think it substantively changes anything, or just sort of brings it back to the fore? Uh, neither. Uh, it is where it was. I suspect the conversation is changing uh, for a good reason and not because of that the government is so devious uh, but I don't think that uh, this week's news does much of anything one way or another. Well particularly Althea when you know people are worried about getting their kids to school there are flare-ups of the you know the, the virus in different parts of the country I, I, I wonder how the opposition keeps it moving um, or if they can. Well, I would actually say it adds a little bit more fuel to the fire because I think that it re-energizes re in some ways the opposition parties. I think the government had been quite successful in kind of changing uh, the channel uh, with, you know, let's talk about the speech from the throne and all these things that we plan on doing. And then here comes like the ghosts of the very recent past. Um, and if anything, I think it also opens the liberals up to saying, hey, you know, we charity and before that what it was known as Free the Children, was a very highly reputable charity. And the Liberals may have contributed to the downfall of a, you know, a well-regarded Canadian uh, not-for-profit. OK, let, let's let's turn to the fall and how people are sort of positioning themselves, e either on the government side or the official opposition. We'll leave it to that for now. How important a moment in time is this going to be, Andrew, uh, the throne speech and, and sort of the, the build-up around it? Uh, hugely important from the sounds of it. Uh, the government seems to have made a decision that uh, they can essentially borrow in unlimited amounts because the money is free, because interest rates are so low. Uh, so the, if, if the leaks and the spin that we've been hearing ahead of time are in any way indicative of what they're planning, they're not satisfied with a deficit that is now in the neighborhood of $400 billion, unheard of, unprecedented by orders of magnitude beyond any deficit we've ever experienced in the past, and they want to go further with the important difference that the deficit that they ran up, up until now was one to, to do with the crisis, with keeping people alive, keeping the lights on uh, through this extraordinary crisis. The t t types of programs they're talking about now are completely different. They're discretionary programs. They're ideas that liberals have for the ways in which they'd like to change society, change the way the economy is run. And I'm not sure people who might have signed on to those earlier emergency deficits are going to be quite as happy to see them going into further into debt for much more discretionary reasons. Yeah, I mean, the Prime Minister has said this will change the direction of, of the country and the country's economy. Is there an appetite for that, uh, Chantal? Surely the government would be thinking about that. 
surely the government uh, has to be thinking that there's an appetite out there for stability or a return to some semblance to normal. So if they are planning to use this to have a campaign on change, I'm not sure there's an appetite out there. But to go back to the change in the conversation, mm -hmm. I do believe that the speech from the throne has already changed the conversation. Uh, and I base that, for instance, on Aaron O'Toole's uh, speech to caucus this week. It wasn't a speech of official opposition lamenting prorogation, the absence of parliament, the we mm -hmm, scandal, mm -hmm. but it was about how the conservatives are getting ready to present an alternative to the government rather than addition for official opposition. So on right. that basis, I'm not sure that the, the liberals are the only ones that want to change the channel from we uh, charity. I think it's to the advantage of the conservatives to be highlighting their alternative to the liberals. Yeah, that, that, that's a smart observation, um, Althea. And it's probably it's probably beneficial in the long the long for the long game for Aaron O'Toole to do that. Absolutely. I think the speech from the throne is basically uh, an opportunity for the conservatives as much as the liberals to present an alternative vision of what uh, they want the public to see their party support. And we've seen Aaron O'Toole actually say that there may be things in the speech from the throne that his conservative party chooses to support. Uh -huh. um, and there's been an, an, an openness there that, um, frankly, is, has been unusual uh, in the last couple of years in Ottawa. Um, so uh, if the speech from the throne lives up to what the government has built it to be, then it will be a, a fundamental rethink of the way uh, Ottawa is engaged in society. And that is a, an opportunity for the Conservatives, because we see in public opinion polls, Nanos had a poll uh, this week in Bloomberg, uh, basically saying that Canadians are split. In fact, most Canadians are, are not in favor of larger deficits and bigger spending. Uh -huh. And so here is a, a, a golden opportunity for the Conservatives to uh, pre present a very distinct vision for their party. Although it's happening, Andrew, at a time when Aaron O'Toole is also saying, well, I, I, I'll worry about the deficit or I'll deal with it in 10 years, which is also sort of a, a strange thing to hear from a conservative and, and something that fiscal conservatives may be uncomfortable with. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd like to see a, a faster timetable than that, but he's been dealt a very difficult hand. We've got deficits now that are heading towards 20 percent of GDP. Uh, even if a substantial chunk of that is taken out next year, one hopes because of the emergency programs coming to an end, you mm -hmm. still have deficits of unheard of size, and those cannot be responsibly done in, in two or three years. It is going to take longer uh, than anyone would prefer, perhaps, from a fiscally conservative standpoint. Uh, so I don't fault him for that. I think there's an enormous opportunity, as, Ch as Chantal and Althea said. Basically, the, the, the center ground has been opened up with the Liberals moving so far left. That's why I'm a little disturbed to see him mouthing rhetoric about Canada first and, and uh, self-sufficiency and, and you know, pr being protectionist in, in various ways. Uh, I guess going after an NDP voter, uh, I, I think that's going to muddy his pitch uh, considerably and, and confuse voters who want to know what a conservative party stands for. Uh, last word, I think, probably to you, Chantal. Uh, it, it, there, surely there's an opportunity here for the government, too, though. I, I, I take everyone's smart points about the conservatives, but there is a there is a chance here for the government to sort of reaffirm or, or reinvent its mandate. Up to a point, but there's also a very tight rope to walk on. Um, it's, it will be revealing of uh, what their sense is of where Canadians are at, uh, the tone and the way that they sell this strong speech. I don't think they've done so far a very good job of preparing for it, uh, and they've let others define that strong speech. We'll see if, uh, in the end, that pays off in the sense that people will say, well, it's a lot more responsible. Uh, than we expected. But I do think that voters are going to look for a sense that they want a government that comes across as responsible. Okay. I'm so glad we, we had that two weeks apart, and I'm so glad you're all back. <laughs> Thank you for being here, and, and we'll talk a lot more, of course, in the weeks ahead. Before we go, though, I uh, just wanted to let you all know as well that Party Lines, my podcast with Elamine Abdul Mahmoud, is back. Uh, that's every Thursday we break down the week's big political news. Well, we broke down weeks of news <laughs> in this edition. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts. But for now, it's back to Adrian and Andrew in Toronto. All right, Rosie, next, the curtain lifts on the Toronto International Film Festival. We won't be seeing red carpets like this, but a scaled-down festival could actually reach more people. We'll explain right after the break.
There will be no red carpets or lines of glittering celebrities at the Toronto International Film Festival this year, but organizers insist the soul of the festival remains the same. Eli Glasner now on TIFF's opening day. It is opening day of the Toronto International Film Festival. For years, the razzle-dazzle of TIFF pushed back the September blahs. But this year, the streets of Toronto are just streets. As the world is still bursting with stories not yet told. In March, the TIFF executive decided the show still must go on. The result, a smaller digital physical hybrid. Instead of red carpets, there are virtual press conferences. There's only about 50 films this year, which you can watch online, at the drive-in, or in a few theaters where masks are now mandated. My name is Dika Handekwa. Or you can call me Beans. Rainbow Dickerson stars in Beans, a new Canadian film about a Mohawk family. As one of this year's TIFF Rising stars, she's excited, we're, but... We're missing out, too, on red carpets uh, together, photo opportunities, and, and really just being, being in the same room with people. I'm a positive person anyway, and quite optimistic. But the star and co-director of Violation sees an upside. With only roughly 50 films and only three films in the Midnight Madness section, there's definitely more attention on the film than there may have been in previous years. The new digital format has also unlocked new audiences. Hey, TIFF is uh, reaching critics who could never uh, attend. I'm originally from Mexico City, but I've lived most of my life now in L.A. And I'm covering this festival for the first time, thanks to the fact that it's uh, happening online. TIFF film. But the festival is also a marketplace where deal makers are learning the art of schmoozing by Zoom. Yeah, that part's really hard. When we can go in person, we're going in person. Um, and I know the talent wants to as well, because you want to be able to engage with the filmmakers, to engage with the audience. But I, we're trying to replicate that. But with the Academy Awards now in April, the festival that prides itself as an Oscar launch pad is rediscovering its original focus. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. British actress Diana Rigg has died. Now, Mr. Amesbury, you wouldn't use that, would you? Not during choir practice. Rigg became a 1960s style icon, a secret agent Emma Peel in the TV series The Avengers. She went on to appear in the James Bond franchise, most recently starred on HBO's Game of Thrones. She was diagnosed with cancer in March. She died at her home this morning. Diana Rigg was 82. Well, next on The National, a camping trip unlike any other. How this Nova Scotia man went from pitching a tent to waking up out to sea. Not hard to see what drew Grant Hatcher to this area. It looked grassy, comfortable, and he was tired after a long ride on his motorcycle. So he pulled over and pitched his tent. But he quickly came to regret that decision. And the reason, it's our moment. I've camped a few times in my life. I could tell that some of the signs probably weren't good that I shouldn't camp there. Sign number one, all the grass was completely flat. Sign number two, I actually touched the grass and tasted it, and it tasted salty. Sign number three, the ground was actually a little squishy beneath my feet. I was tired, I needed a place to stay, and this was the best spot that I thought I could find. And I woke up only because a little dew drop fell from the top of the tent. I go to roll over my whole body. It's like I'm sitting on a bowl of jello. I instantly panic. I go, what? You could imagine what I was thinking and saying. The tide had come in. I was on the ocean. Am I literally floating out in the Atlantic Ocean in the Bay of Fundy? If you've ever been on a waterbed, that's exactly what it felt like. No water in the tent at all, other than a little bit of dew. It's like, at first amazed, like, hell of a tent. So I begin to just drag my tent back to shore in complete and utter shock and shame. So I made it to the hotel got a couple hours of sleep that I started to realize in my head that someday this is going to be a funny story. <laughs> someday. And, and that day is today. Yeah. So our lineup editor, Jeremy, has been talking about Grant all day. Now yeah. you know why. Yeah. little detail there took him, you know, he got back to the hotel. Remember, he was naked, apparently, he says. Uh, and so that required a 45-minute motorcycle ride in very wet clothes. This, this, I mean, this whole thing plays out just like a movie. 
right? Like, or, or at least, I don't know, it should be like a, a three-part miniseries. Yeah. <laughs> so you could, you could make something better. Check out this guy's Facebook page. I guarantee you, you will not be disappointed. That's The National for the September 10th. Have a good night. Good night.